These are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, the second in a series specially designed for our colleagues in sustainable tourism across the globe. My name is Deirdre Sherland and I serve as a consultant to the UNEP Tourism and Environment Program. And we are doing a series of, seven, of, of webinars. This is the second one that we had, uh, we've done so far for colleagues across the globe, stakeholders in the tourism sector, private, public, as well as NGOs, to uh, prepare ourselves for the side event that UNEP, in collaboration with the Government of France and the Government of the Kingdom of Morocco, intend to host at the 22nd sitting of the Conference of Parties of the United Nations Conference on Climate Change. Today we focus on climate, the climate agenda, the international climate agenda, and we have two speakers whom I will introduce you to shortly, but for the purposes of our listening audience, you are in listen-only mode, and uh, you will be, of course, welcomed. We welcome your participation at the end of the presentations, which will take place over the next 40 minutes or so. And we would ask you to use the chat box at the bottom of your windows and to write short, brief, and very succinct questions to our, stu our two speakers. We will collate it here at office, and of course, um, I will uh, vocalize your questions, provided, of course, that I can uh, uh, have a very succinct question. I would ask you also to please indicate your name and your institution so that I can properly direct the question to the relevant speaker. So um, with that said, I would want to say also that um, this webinar is being brought to you by UNEP, uh, courtesy the government of Morocco as well as the government of France. And I am very pleased to introduce our two speakers. The first, we will hear from Professor Daniel Scott, who serves as the University Research Chair in Geography and Environmental Management, as well as the Director of the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Daniel has worked extensively in climate change in the global tourism sector, and uh, he, he will go first. He will also uh, summarize for us, for the, our tourism stakeholders, the Paris Agreement and the implications. Our second speaker this afternoon is Professor Stefan Gosling, who has studied interrelationships of tourism, transport, and sustainability for more than 25 years. He works and focuses on aviation, automobility, cycling, in the climate agenda, as well as the policy and the carbon markets. So I'm very pleased to introduce our two speakers to you. We will start with um, Daniel, who will summarize for us the, the, the climate agenda coming out of, of the Paris Agreement held last November here in Paris. Daniel, the floor is yours. And uh, of course, I'll change the slides for you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, and let me thank all of you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules, uh, no matter what time of the day it is in your part of the world. Uh, these issues are, are so fundamental to the future growth and sustainability of tourism. Um, I really look forward to your questions and, and exploring how we can uh, advance the climate change agenda together um, outside of this webinar series. Uh, next slide, please. So in the time I have, I, I want to speak to three main points um, coming out of the Paris Agreement. Um, first of all, just a, a quick overview um, to put in context how we got to the Paris Agreement. Um, the second point I want to discuss are some of the key provisions of the Paris Agreement. Now there are many and we've chosen to discuss about five that we think that fits the time um, and are probably the most relevant to tourism. Um, the third point are then to look at some of those key provisions and what are the implications from the tourism section, sector. And, and that's where I'll, I'll transition over to, to uh, Stefan's presentation, who will then look at some of these things a little bit further. Next slide, please. So looking back again, how did we get to the Paris Agreement? How did it develop? Um, almost 25 years ago, um, we have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, the Paris Agreement, like the pre Kyoto Protocol before it, is, is part of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and, and as the Kyoto Protocol's uh, first commitment period um, was ending in 2012, we were trying to negotiate a successor agreement. Um, we reached an impasse in Copenhagen that most of you will be well familiar with. Um, 
and so we ended up negotiating in a different way, coming up with a fundamentally different uh, type of agreement. And, and some had argued um, that the Paris Agreement was, or the Paris negotiations was, were too big to fail in some people's opinion, and we couldn't afford another lost decade. So one of the greatest successes coming out of Paris was that we have an agreement um, at all and that the level of participation in it. Um, it is done a little bit differently than the Kyoto Protocol. Of, um, and, and one of the important things is the non-binding targets, and I'll speak to that a little bit later. Um, but the other important point, that the green, the last bullet I have there is, is that we've set up, uh, or it has been set up, a mechanism that there's, there's no end to the commitment period, if you will. There are a series of five-year cycles that will keep the Paris uh, agreement and the negotiations related to it ongoing for, for many decades to come. Next slide, please. So Paris Agreement, um, the very first day it was open for signing, 175 countries um, signed it, which was a very visible sign of, of the support. Many of the global leaders um, were there to do so in person, so that was wonderful to see as well. Um, as I mentioned, the Paris Agreement contains, uh, it's a, different than the Kyoto Protocol, it contains a mixture of mandatory and non-mandatory provisions. Um, for example, so each country or signatory is obliged to define and report their progress on emission reductions, um, but they're not committed to achieve them um, per se. Um, the Paris Agreement is, has been subject, you've all seen that in, in your various medias from around the world, to, to both acclaim and criticism, um, being called everything from a historical breakthrough to, in some cases, people calling it a, a major setback or a triumph of hope over facts. Um, it truly represents a balance between idealism and pragmatism, um, and so if you're being criticized from both sides of the agenda, perhaps you, you got it right, which is good, um, good to see, and that's sort of our opinion on it. Um, it's not a solution to the climate change challenge um, by itself. It's another of our steps in the right direction, if you will. Whether it goes fast enough, um, that's something that uh, commentators are still debating. Um, the final point there that I've got, um, you know, the, the, that bottom line question is, um, is the Paris Agreement the beginning of the, you know, the end for the fossil fuel era? Or does it ensure that we're going to actually exceed the climate change safeguard thresholds that we've set in policy? And then Stefan and I would agree that the answer is actually both. Um, and both of those have implications for tourism, and that's what we'll discuss over the next couple minutes. Next slide, please. So what, what did the Paris Agreement actually achieve, and, and how is it different um, than previous climate treaties? I, I'm going to focus on, on five main areas um, over the next few minutes, and I'll say a few words about each of these in, in, in succession. Um, the first of those is, is much strengthened climate policy goals, um, moving from, well below, or from 2 degrees to well below 2 degrees to, to even 1.5 degrees we're hoping for um, versus pre-industrial era. Um, number two, a worldwide participation in greenhouse gas reduction ambitions, so moving beyond a subset of countries to now all countries are effectively involved in some way, shape, or form. Um, number three, an enhanced framework for increasing ambitions over time and reporting progress, that's important. Um, improving the transparency, so that links to that previous point in emissions reporting, something that tourism sector needs to work harder at. Um, and then the greater emphasis on climate risk management or through adaptation. So the importance of recognizing adaptation is much strengthened in this agreement as well. Next slide, please. So all of you will recall the, the central objective of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is to avoid what, what has been defined as, as dangerous interference in the climate system or avoid dangerous climate change. Um, this has been translated in the past into a policy goal of, of restricting global warming um, relative to the pre-industrial era to, to about 2 degrees um, Celsius. Um, in the gray box, I've highlighted there, um, based on the evidence from the IPCC's fifth assessment that came out prior to the Paris Agreement, um, the Paris Agreement now strengthens that goal, that target, to, in their words, well below 2 degrees and to pursue 1.5 degrees that some countries, particularly the small island development states, 
um, had pressured the international community to seek a stronger goal. So we're, we're now aiming at those policy targets. The, the larger figure below that shows the emission reductions um, pledged under the Paris Agreement. So that is the orange um, highlighting, if you will. And what that shows is a, is a substantial improvement over a business as usual um, trajectory, which was the gray, um, the top gray blue color, and compared to our previous policy commitments. So that was that light blue current policy. So it, you can see a substantial improvement there. Um, another key point in this figure is to show when do would we would we need to achieve the minus 50% emission reductions and the net zero emission, which is effectively balancing any remaining emissions with the capacity to take those emissions out of the atmosphere. And you can see um, for plus two or well below plus two, um, the 50% minus 50% has to be achieved. So those are the, the green and orange arrows. Uh, would have to be achieved in the, by the late 2040s. And if we wanted to achieve the 1.5 degree, um, we would have to achieve uh, a minus 50% emissions reductions by the late 2030s. So that, that is an ambitious, ambitious schedule. Next slide, please. So the next big change in the Paris Agreement is, is the level or degree of participation of all different countries. And if you'll recall in the Kyoto Protocol, um, we had binding emission reduction, so that was different um, for 34 um, developed countries. So a, a relatively small set of countries um, with a slightly larger, obviously, percentage of the global emissions. What we have this go around with the Paris Agreement is a much improved um, universal participation. So we have 185 countries have submitted their um, intended nationally determined contributions. So their intent, their ambitions, if you will. Um, and I've included a couple of examples here. Um, overall, the, the agreement retains the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. That's important. And we can see that in an example where India has set its ambitions as reducing its emission intensity compared to its GDP by 30, 33 to 35%, um, whereas in contrast, the EU is, is focusing on absolute reductions um, of 40% below their 1990 levels. And so the, the level of participation was important um, because it recognizes that the, the, the state of the challenge or the size of the challenge is such that no country could remain sort of to be exempted from emission reductions. And similarly, no sector can expect to be exempted on emission reductions. And that's a point that Stefan will probably return to in his talk in a moment. Next slide, please. So one of the difficulties in the past with the Kyoto Protocol and, and other agreements um, was that when their commitment period ended, so the Kyoto Protocol in 2012, there was a level of uncertainty as to what would come next. Would the, those long-term goals, would they get strengthened? Would they, would they continue? Would things you know, fall, potentially fall apart? And, in, and that would pose the barrier to, to investments, particularly in long-term investments that needed that time to, to uh, pay off for both governments and business. So one of the important um, new components um, of the Paris Agreement is this new, as it's usually referred to, global stock taking uh, governance architecture, where we now have, where we'll have five year cycles. Um, in some ways, in that respect, we will always have, have Paris moving forward and unless all of the parties agree to change this. Um, starting in 2018, we'll have a dialogue or a stock take on our mitigation progress, and then that will continue. So in 2023, we'll take another look. 2028, that will continue. And the other cycle that will continue sort of simultaneously is as of 2020, we will have new or updated national climate plans that will be submitted. So new and, and the intent is that the ambition will increase both on the mitigation side and on the adaptation side as we move along. And it too will have a five-year cycle moving forward. Next slide, please. And as part of that process, um, both of five-year um, cycles, there's also a, a very strong and new emphasis on transparency. Um, in order to increase the credibility and confidence in reporting, all of the countries that have signed on have agreed to a new uh, harmonized um, accounting, greenhouse gas accounting system. 
and that will be developed um, by, by a special committee or an expert panel of the IPCC. So that was something agreed to by all the different countries as part of the Paris Agreement. Simultaneously, most of you will be well aware, um, markets around the world, be it Europe, um, Asia, North America, um, et cetera, the markets are also pushing for increased um, risk, climate change risk disclosure. And this is just one quote from, from Mark Carney, the, the governor of the Bank of England, um, noting how many of the top global countries are actually reporting and that there is a requirement um, to do more. And I think it's only a matter of time before that requirement. Certainly publicly traded companies in the tourism sector will be required to report um, under a fairly standardized system. Next slide, please. And so a final point that I want to raise is, is, uh, is the increased prominence of adaptation. So this recognizes that you know, re we set higher um, ambitions for greenhouse gas mitigation, but regardless of our success on emission reductions, um, climate change is underway. Um, we see that um, news almost on a monthly basis or a weekly basis sometimes of new studies that show us that. Um, and it will accelerate in the near term. So we recognize that um, and that responding and, and preparing for climate impacts, um, inc increasing adaptive capacity are as important as reducing our greenhouse gases. One of the points that, that was a point of emphasis under the Paris Agreement is, is the, the sort of renewed focus on the most vulnerable countries um, that face the greatest challenges. Um, a number of those are small island developing states and, and it, particularly there is where tourism must be an important part of increasing the climate resilience of those countries because it plays an, a very important part of their economies. Next slide please. So a couple of words on, on what was not accomplished by the Paris Agreement. Again, there were criticisms um, and we continue to see some of those. One of the central criticisms, this is a figure I showed you earlier, um, is the gap between the policy targets. So the Paris Agreement sets out to achieve that yellow line, the below two degrees, or even better yet, the green line, which is, is the below 1.5 degree target. So those are the policy ambitions of the Paris Agreement. The pledges that have been put forward, the ambitions thus far, are the orange line. And you can see, yes, it, as I mentioned, it was a substantial improvement where we were before, but it doesn't reach um, the level of those policy um, targets. So that's something that we will continue to have to work to um, with increased ambitions. And because our record of achieving emission reductions in the past has, has been mixed, it will say, um, some consider currently those orange pledges to be optimistic. And that's that was one of the reasons for the greater emphasis on adaptation, but also the need for those five-year cycles to increase ambitions um, to um, improve our situation so we can achieve those policy targets of the orange, or sorry, the yellow and the green. Next slide, please. Now, there were a few very specific things. Um, global stakeholders around the world um, were looking for a few key policy commitments um, that didn't make it into the Paris Agreement, a, a few of those. So, for example, uh, establishing a global price on carbon. Um, carbon pricing is increasing around the world, um, more and more jurisdictions, but a global price was something that some people saw. Um, there was no commitment to terminate the almost $500 billion annually in subsidies um, for the fossil fuel industry that, that other proponents were looking for. Similarly, the, there was no moratorium or ban on the approximately 1,200 proposed coal power, power plants. So that's an infrastructure legacy that, that um, others are, are trying to avoid. Perhaps the most meaningful one for tourism is, again, the emissions um, related to international aviation and shipping. Um, were removed from the Paris Agreement in the sort of last round of negotiations. Um, depending on who you talk to, it, it seems ICAO will be given one more, some would argue, sort of one last chance to implement a sectoral strategy. So they have their Carbon Neutral Growth 2020 strategy that they're looking to implement at their major conference this fall. Um, as the two quotes that I've got there, there are, I've shown you there are various voices that, that uh, voice their concern. Um, the European Parliament pointing out that stabilizing emissions at 2020 levels is just not enough in their opinion. Um, Nordic countries again pointing out that if 
if we don't get these sectors um, in, engaged in the Paris Agreement and with, with real emission reductions um, that puts at risk the two degree level. Um, so those are changes that will continue to unfold um, over the next, uh, certainly over the next few months, but we'll see what comes out of the conference this fall. Next slide, please. So looking at some of the specific implications for tourism, um, one of the first things we can look at are, in our sector, are our emission trends and our emission reduction ambitions, are they compatible with the Paris Agreement? Um, and, and that's what this figure generally shows. Um, years ago, Stefan and I and a team of, of people worked with, with UNEP and UNWTO um, and others to uh, set up a, a, a 2005 uh, benchmark, the, the estimated emissions at that time, and then a business as usual uh, strat uh, pathway um, went up to about 2035. So that's the blue line that's shown there. The green stars at the bottom of the figure are the emission reduction ambitions that have been put forward by WTTC and, and endorsed by UNWTO and others. Um, and there, the sort of longer term goal of a, of a minus 50 from 2005 level um, emissions by 2035, that is very positively, that's, that's compatible with the Paris Agreement. So if we could achieve that, we would be um, doing our part as a sector in the same way countries around the world are doing. So the real question left to us is, is how do we close this gap between where we're headed or where we think we're headed, the blue line, and the green stars, which are our ambitions? Stefan will speak a bit more to that, um, but next slide, please. But I'll say a couple words to it. Um, there are two sort of questions that come from that. Um, first of all, are we on the right path? So are we headed up that blue line or are we headed um, towards those green stars? That's our, our bottom line question we want to know. And the second question is, would we know we're making progress? Um, do we have sufficient monitoring to know which direction we're actually headed? And to answer the first question, WTTC released a report before the uh, Paris Agreement uh, or Paris Conference, um, and they found a subset of their members had reduced their emissions emission intensity, um, which is great, um, but of course intensity is not the same as absolute reduction, which is what we're, our ambitions are. Um, we had done simultaneously a separate analysis um, where we looked at both WTTC members that we could find information online about, as well as other about 120 or so other companies that were reporting through the Global Reporting Initiative. Um, and what we found there is the majority of companies still were not reporting on greenhouse gas emissions. So that was a barrier to knowing which direction we were actually headed. And of the, of the companies we were able to get information on, about half um, were showing uh, either in a, a stabilized emissions or perhaps an increase. So we have half the companies that are reducing perhaps and half um, they're increasing. So we, we didn't find evidence that we're on the right path um, just yet at this point. Next slide, please. And that links to the, this uh, important um, progress that we'll have to make. Right now we have a, a lack of monitoring and reporting which makes it difficult to understand or establish what our trajectory for emissions actually are. Um, and that we don't know if we're making progress even if we were, which is a difficult thing to, to explain to the, to the uh, governance around the world. Um, positively, the, the hotel measurement a carbon measurement initiative. Um, that's very helpful, certainly at an enterprise um, level. Um, what we need is something similar uh, with similar credibility at a sector-wide scale. So that's something that we'll have to work toward the, the sector and hopefully that can be a point of discussion um, in Morocco later this year. The last, um, the bottom of the slide that I've got there is it links to this, this point on, on increased transparency, both on climate risks but also emissions. Um, and that growing expectation of the, of the global community for increased transparency. And those of you who attended the webinar last week will remember this relates to that report that was discussed. And the attempt, in this case, of Australia to suppress the risk um, is an example of how not to be transparent. And in this case, um, worked against them from a PR perspective in that it earned probably 100 times the negative press coverage and reputational risk than if they had just acknowledged that 
part of their um, their assets, their tourism assets, was at risk, just like many other heritage properties around the world. Next slide, please. And so the last point um, I want to talk to is, is understanding and, and managing climate change and climate policy risks. Um, I work with the insurance industry um, and, and, and many other sectors, but particularly the insurance industry. They now res they understand very, very clearly that um, and very firmly that um, both assessing um, and understanding your risk, but reporting those risks, climate risks, is part of their fiduciary responsibility of their board of, of directors or trustees, um, senior government officials and others. Um, they understand that, and that's partly the reason why they've they've put $5 million into our center uh, alone to help, help them try to understand their risk um, and report it um, with credibility. I don't get the same sense from the tourism sector that I work with uh, around the world, so that's something I think that we need to improve upon um, as a sector. And, and as we've pointed out before, there, there's much remains to be done in terms of understanding um, the climate risk for destinations and companies. Um, because there is a danger. A lot of the stuff we see, Stefan and I see in, in the media, um, is often scientifically inaccurate. Um, and then there's a real danger into that sort of reputational risk for things that um, the tourism sector shouldn't have to deal with. So correcting that can only be done when we actually accurately understand our risk. Next slide, please. And so to conclude, um, what I want to come back to is, is this question is, you know, is, is tourism ready to be a strong contributor to the Paris Agreement? Um, and I think right now our short answer is, is not yet. Um, positively, these statements that I've included here um, are from tourism leadership at a global scale. Um, they've signaled their intention to increase the climate change response, so that's wonderful. We've worked with different parts of, of this, these organizations. And if you can just click one, one more ahead. There we go. So I think there's a real important opportunity coming up. Um, before I turn it over to Stefan, this, this important opportunity is, is coming up for us um, in, in November. Um, that if a number of, of people listening to this webinar, I hope many of you are able to attend or contribute to this, I think that is an opportunity, a real opportunity for us to, uh, to advance the climate change roadmap uh, for tourism. So I thank UNEP and the government of Morocco and France for giving us that opportunity. I hope many of us will take advantage of that. And last slide, please. And with that, I, I want to thank all of you. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over back to Deirdre, who will get, let Stefan uh, have the next 15 or so minutes. Thank you. And thank you very much, Daniel. And I forgot to mention, Stefan, and forgive me for doing so, that you are a professor from the School of Business and Economics at Linnaeus University in Sweden. The floor is yours, Stefan. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Dan. For your excellent introduction, I plan to continue here with a more specific view on tourism and the tourism sector. I presume my presentation is coming up here any minute. Yes, here we are, if you move on. And another one. Thank you. Um, just a very quick recap on the status quo. Um, if we really want to achieve or stay within the two Celsius degrees global warming guardrails, uh, guardrail, um, we all need to understand that contributions in terms of mitigations will be needed by all economic sectors. Um, tourism is, as I will um, explain to you in more detail over the next slides, a growth sector and um, it cannot be uh, next um, and it cannot be exempt from from efforts to, uh, to reduce emissions because it is too big unfortunately uh, for other sectors to um, to uh, uh, to compensate for the non-action that um, that uh, would characterize tourism in that case so um, the, the main problem with tourism is that it's uh, characterized by rapid growth in, in transport, uh, mostly air travel, car travel, but also accommodation. And that can be uh, seen in the next slide where I present you with some work I've done with Paul Peters um, on uh, tourism growth and emissions from the different subsectors. Uh, you can see here in different colors um, how the different subsectors would grow in terms of 
emissions. And you can see that uh, in 2010, uh, tourism was contributing to about 1.1 megatons of uh, emissions, and that is going to grow rapidly. So we anticipate that in a scenario where uh, technology change is already considered, um, that emissions will nevertheless double by 2035 or shortly after that in the period uh, to 2040 perhaps. And the most relevant growth subsectors are aviation, of course, in um, the lighter blue here, and the accommodation sector. We anticipate that uh, cars will also grow, car traffic. Uh, but with regard to cars, there's probably opportunities to reduce the emission intensity. So overall, um, even in a scenario where very significant action is taken in terms of technology change, you see that nevertheless tourism's contribution to climate change will rapidly continue to grow. And that, next slide please, is of course in stark contrast then to uh, the decarbonization scenario that we would need to 2050, uh, where you can see that uh, there's a growing discrepancy between the decarbonization scenario and the business as usual that we're seeing at the moment. Unfortunately, people are very often um, confused by, I would uh, even call it to some degree, attempts of greenwashing by industry to, um, because very often we are told that industry is becoming increasingly um, less carbon intense, and that is true, um, but it does not help because you always have to look into absolute emissions, and that um, I want to uh, illustrate with the next slide here, uh, which is for the aviation sector. And um, if you please go on to the next slide. And uh, you can see here two uh, uh, polygons, two lines that are crossing. The one line, the black line, is uh, the relative um, efficiency of different aircraft types over time. And you can see that in, indeed aircraft have become ever more efficient. So it will take you um, an increasingly small amount of fuel to fly a person from uh, one location to the other. Unfortunately, however, there's a growing number of people flying every year and there's also a tendency that those who are already flying uh, do so more, more often and to more distant uh, destinations. So in other words, even though we have efficiency gains, uh, that doesn't prevent the whole sector from um, uh, further growth, which is the broken line here. And um, this broken line represents absolute uh, growth in fuel use and um, emissions. So you can see, even though we are making progress uh, um, technology-wise, this doesn't help climate change. In light of this, um, there's a question here, what is needed for the future? In the next slide, please. And um, what we would need on a global level is that uh, emissions from tourism are monitored. This should also happen at national and business levels. Uh, as Dan already illustrated, uh, we don't have this kind of monitoring at the moment. There is no year-on-year follow-up on how uh, emissions from different subsectors develop. And uh, this is non-existent at uh, 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 global, national, or business levels for, for the most part. Even if you look into those businesses that Dan talked about, you will see that there's huge differences in terms of how emissions are accounted for, what is included, and so on. So significant progress has to, made, uh, to be made on this basis. Um, then we need uh, agreement on absolute emission reduction levels for various timelines that make it um, relevant uh, to, or that make it possible to interpolate um, and backcast from a given uh, future scenario to today, and then to identify specific targets for the different subsectors, in um, uh, specifically aviation and cruises, which are outside the global uh, negotiations on, on, um, on uh, per, country, uh, per country levels. So um, for all, the, all other subsectors, we would need national targets, and then um, these would have to be implemented by, uh, by businesses into specific action plans. And there should be incentives to encourage businesses and disincentives uh, uh, to uh, ensure that there's a meeting of targets. Otherwise, it will, I'm afraid, uh, remain empty rhetorics for the most part. 
And um, the very important conclusion here is that, uh, in my personal opinion, without a significant increase in the cost of energy, uh, it is very unlikely that we're going to see um, reductions in the use of energy and hence emissions. So to come to the next slide, low carbon futures. Um, we have to be honest in acknowledging that there are no climate policies um, at the moment in place for tourism. Um, most countries don't consider tourism as a sector in itself rather than uh, um, as a, a set of uh, subsectors that uh, work together. And um, there is at the moment no real um, roadmap as to how we can decarbonize the tourism sector on either level, global, national, or uh, business scale. On the other hand, if the Paris Agreement uh, is taken seriously, we uh, need to see a significant increase in the cost of energy and the abolishment of energy subsidies, as Dan already pointed out. Both is unlikely at the moment, uh, yet I think um, we may see such a development in the short-term future, which then would mean the cost of energy will increase, and then um, there's also an issue in terms of customer relationships, uh, where businesses uh, that take action will have a better um, um, uh, opportunity to uh, build customer, customer relationships on their work uh, for a global common future. So um, the conclusion here is that even though um, businesses should be prepared for energy futures that are more costly, um, both in terms of energy but, but also in terms of water produ production, I, I added this because global water production is actually uh, using uh, a large share of, of uh, energy. So water production and energy are interlinked. And um, one will uh, demand the other, in other words, if energy costs go up, the cost of water will also increase and vice versa. So that's very important to acknowledge here that saving on both energy and water is a very important thing to do. And very importantly for tourism businesses, this is not necessarily anything that will cost businesses. Uh, to the opposite, um, in my um, global experience from work with very many different hotels and tourism businesses, um, I have seen that it's possible to save at least 20% um, of energy at no cost. In other words, if you start saving energy, this will directly add to your bottom line, to your economic bottom line. So the good news is here really that um, for most businesses, there's a lot of uh, money to be saved by engaging with um, mitigation and uh, that at a very moderate cost or very short uh, payback times. So and saving energy is easy and economical for most businesses and um, there is also reason for leading companies to uh, regularly publish data on their emissions and then to also seek to buy offsets uh, from UN certified gold standard projects, uh, so-called uh, gold standard certified emission reduction units because this then would mean that leading companies will not only acknowledge that they um, are responsible for a share of emissions, but they would also seek through this action to actually neutralize the impact on climate change. So that is something that can be done at a very low um, cost and hence have great implications for uh, the global tourism system. Um, at this point, um, I should talk about the tourism value chain and the different actors that are part of the tourism value chain and how they can um, engage with action to reduce emissions. Uh, there is no time for that, but I wanted to very quickly have a look at destinations as well. Um, destinations um, are key in reducing emissions from tourism for the very reason that most emissions from tourism are associated with travel. So if destinations uh, target closer markets in their marketing campaigns, um, that is a major uh, measure that will reduce emissions um, from tourism simply because the average distance that is traveled to get to the destination will reduce. So 
um, that is something destinations should really think about. Most destinations at the moment look in the other direction. How can we um, address and invite a global market? I think uh, uh, smart destinations in terms of climate change should do the opposite and try to decarbonize their tourism product by trying to find um, guests that are coming from close by. And they should also then um, offer incentives to increase length of stay because globally length of stay has been declining, which simply means that if the number of people staying in your destination um, is uh, constant, uh, then you will lose turnover because the overall um, number of uh, guest nights is going to fall given that people stay for a, longer, a shorter period of time. So it's very important for uh, destination managers to think about mechanisms that can increase length of stay again. Uh, they should also introduce low carbon mobility offers. There's a lot of um, different opportunities here, um, both in terms of getting to the destinations, but also in terms of moving around within the destination. Um, cities like Copenhagen that have focused on low carbon mobility offers in particular, um, in particular bicycling in the case of Copenhagen have seen a major upswing in, in tourism because tourists really like it. So there's many things we can do in this direction. And then uh, obviously destinations should also initiate systemic change in the accommodation sector where a lot of uh, energy, water and uh, other resources are used. And um, uh, this slide then would illustrate on um, how destinations have changed. This is from uh, work with Dan again. Um, um, over time, uh, here in the period be between 1995 and 2010, and you can see that um, in, in many destinations, the average energy that is needed to take one tourist to these destinations has increased from the blue to the red bar, even though there have also been destinations like the uh, Seychelles that have managed to uh, reduce the average per tourist footprint by attracting closer markets. So there's a lot of um, uh, room here for destinations to decarbonize. And uh, to add this, um, the next slide please. Um, uh, this also coming from uh, work uh, that Dan has done. Uh, we calculate the cost of um, uh, making the uh, global tourism economy um, uh, stay in line through decarbonization, through offsetting uh, and uh, greater action on, in terms of technology, um, make them stay on track with the climate uh, goals as outlined by IPCC. And you can see that um, the cost um, in terms of uh, the share of turnover is um, small even if we extrapolate this to 2050. Uh, where of course, uh, of course it will be increasingly difficult to reduce emissions and hence the costs are increasing, but um, in 2020 the cost of the, um, staying um, on track with climate goals is just 0.1% of turnover for global tourism. So this is really something uh, tourism businesses should consider. As I said, I cannot in all detail uh, discuss the different options that exist. There's a book on this, um, Carbon Management and Tourism, and there's 33 case studies um, just uh, for you to uh, have a look at these. The next two slides con uh, contain the whole list of, of different case studies here. It's everything from destinations to specific approaches to uh, low um, uh, low carbon transport to uh, food management and so on. So this uh, you can find in the book and have um, your own ideas about how to uh, reduce emissions from, from tourism. So conclusions, uh, policy change can be anticipated. Um, if we are serious about climate change mitigation, then uh, we will see a rising cost of energy. So managers should anticipate this. Uh, they should also prepare then for such changes, changes because obviously you don't want to be unprepared for uh, changing changes in the global economy as Dan already outlined. And um, as I said, most management at the moment will be cost neutral or even economically beneficial. So it should be an op opportunity rather than uh, something that is mandatory uh, for tourism businesses to reduce emissions. And uh, hence my recommendation here to make carbon management a key priority because at the moment it clearly is not. Thank you very much.
you very much, Dr. Stefan Goslin from the University of Linnaeus in uh, Sweden. And we heard just a few minutes earlier from Dr. Daniel Scott from also the University of, of Waterloo in Canada. We have been getting questions, and for some of our listeners who are just joining in, I just remind you that to, to submit your questions in writing using the chat uh, facility of, of your dialog box on screen, and if you can make it as short as possible. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. I will start off. I will use my moderator's prerogative to start off asking questions to our speakers. The first one goes to you, Daniel. You, you outlined what sounds like relatively good news for the tourism sector in terms of a very strengthened policy environment. Can you say specifically what disadvantages might exist at the destination level from a policy perspective based on your research or any research that you may have done? in terms of the tourism sector being able to comply at national levels to the requirements of the Paris Agreement? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Deirdre. And, and one of the challenges, and Stefan alluded it, to it as well, is that <clears throat> currently most countries, either in their, their, their nationally determined um, contributions or in, in previous policies that Stefan had done an analysis of, it was difficult to find where the tourism sector sat, so they, they weren't mentioned or identified um, specifically. So that, that has, some might say, well, that's an advantage and that you're flying under the radar. I, I look at it the other way around in that if they don't recognize you can be part of the solution, they're not going to come to you and partner with you to make those solutions happen. So that's part of our, our challenge, if you will, is, as we mentioned from a, from a monitoring um, and reporting perspective, um, we need to show the world where are we, um, what is the benchmark um, we have as, as some of the quotes I identified, the, the, the commitment from leadership within the sector to, to go in the right direction, to be consistent with the Paris Agreement. Um, now we need the policies and other things in place that will help the sector transition to where it wants to be and to make its contribution. So we, we need to raise that level of awareness that we can be part of the solution, not just on the mitigation side, but I think there's a real opportunity for us to go to both from an international development and other perspectives to work with countries, to work with the sector, to work with um, the countries that, that under the Paris Agreement have responsibilities to support adaptive capacity in other parts of the world um, to make the case that tourism can be part of those solutions um, and that's part when I, when I say we need a roadmap that's partly what I'm saying we need to do is these are the thing here's how we can make a difference these are some of the policies we think need to be in place and Stefan alluded to some of them that will help us as the sector make the transition um, and also on the adaptation side here's how we can work with destination countries and at the community level to make some of those things happen. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Daniel. My question for Stefan is in respect of the comments you made about long-haul destinations, which might be sl a slightly bitter pill for many of our land-based tourism participants who are listening on to the, pr on to the webinar today, simply because they have uh, long-haul tourism travel is probably part of an ingrained product at the destination. So my question to you, Stefan, is whether or not there are any uh, other options that the land-based sector might have, or even the, water, uh, the cruise industry, that your research has revealed. Are there any technology steps, any other options that they can uh, put together in their carbon accounting to offset the, the obvious challenges that they will have, or they will face, or they are facing as a long-haul destination? Um, I have a limited level of uh, sympathy, I think, for long-haul destinations, uh, even though I acknowledge that they may often depend on tourism to a large degree. Um, I have been to a number of countries in my life, um, and I've seen many of those long-haul destinations from inside. What I've always seen is that there is no energy management. So before you start complaining, uh, start looking into your products. There's a million things you can do before it even gets to the point where it starts hurting. Um, having said that, um, I think all destinations need to acknowledge that the future 
where we have runaway climate change is a lot worse than a future with a little less tourism. So I think there is a million measures we can try to engage with in order to make our tourism uh, products less carbon intense. We can also um, try to engage in a lot of different ways with food management, with water management and resource management more generally in these destinations. And when all of that is done, when um, measures have been taken to increase average length of stay and so on, then I'm totally happy to, to listen to, these, um, to this understanding again that uh, any measure uh, that is increasing the cost of energy is uh, detriment detrimental to these destinations, but at the moment I'm not. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, I'm going to take a, a question from our audience, and it comes from Heidi van der Watt, who I know comes from South Africa, and she's asking about whether the markets on our doorstep, and in fact, she's making a comment that the markets on, our, on the, the doorstep of South Africa have low economic yields, which in her opinion is a catch-22. Have you any comment on that, Daniel? You have to. Um, well, that, that's cer yeah, I'm back on. Um, that's certainly a difficulty that some parts, some destinations will face. Uh, some are, are, are blessed, if you will, with, with large, either by number or, or high revenue markets nearby. Um, partly, as Stefan has said, um, we haven't looked at what kind of difference can we really make um, by some of these market um, changes. And, and it, in a case like South Africa, it may not be the solution for them. Um, but that's where I would say to a country like South Africa and others um, that, are, that are small island countries and others that, that, that depend on long-haul tourism, um, one of the points that they have to make, I think, um, to, to the, the broad international community is that if we are going to have some kind of technological solution going forward out of aviation, um, that rather than leaving it to the aviation sector, um, part of it should be a partnership of aviation tourism writ broadly um, but also some of the countries like South Africa or, or small island developing states that depend on longer haul tourism um, to demand of the countries that, that have responsibilities under the Paris Agreement to support green technology, to support R&D, to put a real focus on what type of solution can we come up with um, in terms of be it biofuels or other sort of emerging technologies that can help reduce um, the emission reduction from aviation. The, 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 in the near term, anything that we see on the drawing board so far, um, we know um, we're going to have to rely on market prices and buying carbon credits from other sectors, but in the longer term, that's not an end game um, for the tourism sector. So I think part of the, the discussion has to be um, as a broader partnership going to Europe and North America and other parts of the world and demanding at least a good chunk of that R&D um, technology transfer be focused on this aviation question. Right. Uh, Stefan, any comment? Unmute. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, what Dan said. Uh, aviation is, is, is uh, the issue here, and it will be for as long as we can think uh, into the future at the moment um, because it's the major challenge where we don't see solutions really. Um, to come back to the original question whether we can do more with existing markets even though they are low yield, um, we've done research in um, Sweden. We found that there is considerable scope to increase spending by different markets. Um, I have done research in the Bahamas. 72% uh, of respondents, international tourists, said that they did not spend as much money as they had planned. So there's your challenge. I think you can do a lot more, even with low yield markets, in order to increase uh, revenue and, most of all, profits from your tourism system. But it demands management. Thank you. And, I, and this question is for you, Stefan. It comes from Ada Torres Ramirez from Puerto Rico and from an organization called BusinessWise, and she asks, please elaborate on the distinction between carbon intensity and absolute emissions reductions. What would the recommendations be for standard, for standard reporting that would show comparability so that tourists can better choose? 
Okay, just very quickly to recap, the emission intensity is the amount of energy you need to uh, engage in a certain action, say to drive a car with two people from A to B. Each year we're making progress, there's new technology, so the amount of energy of, for taking a person from A to B will decline. That is the emission intensity. Then absolute emissions is the total amount of emissions that we're emitting. So in other words, if you have a car that is declining in its energy use, but you use that car more often, you may overcompensate the impact or the effect of uh, reducing um, this car's um, average uh, fuel standard. So it's very important to always distinguish the two. And uh, I think what we need to look at at the business level is very often uh, relative uh, emissions or the emission intensity because on that basis we can make comparisons. For instance, how much energy is needed for a bed night? And if a hotel has a very high footprint, uh, uses a lot of energy for a bed night, you can start looking into the reasons for that and you can find or figure out how other hotels do better by a certain uh, type of action. And for destinations or for countries, um, and at the global level, we need to look into uh, global emissions from an absolute um, viewpoint because that is the only thing that matters climate-wise, what is the absolute level of emissions that we're emitting. And for that, we have to have a different reporting standard that um, very simply is an aggregate of the total amount of energy use translated into, into emissions, which is uh, proportional to fuel use. And there's uh, procedures for that. Yeah, sorry. Mm. Thank you very much. No, it's, it's Dan here. Yes, go ahead, John. Can I just add to that? Um, so, so yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and one of the sort of bottom line things, if, if we're doing our monitoring well, um, we need to know our absolute emissions. So if you're going to calculate intensity um, by bed nights, by number, number of kilometers flown or by rental car agencies or even by economic terms, you still need to know the absolute to be able to divide it by whatever other performance metric you're using. So it doesn't change our monitoring um, and, you, and if you're calculating your absolute emissions and then showing as Stefan suggested, which I agree with, your intensity versus competitors, um, you can show it in a number of different ways. So it's, it's easiest to calculate the absolute emissions and then report it the way that, that you see fit if it's comparing against competitors or if it's trying to achieve your overall emission reduction goals, then it would be in absolute terms. Thank you very much, Daniel. I have a, a, a bit of a long question from Herbert Hamillet from uh, Ecotrans based here in Europe. And uh, maybe, Stefan, it, it, it might be a question to you. He says that a new key initiative, the Copernicus Climate Change Service, that is the C3S has been launched and uh, he expects that uh, progressively by 2020 it should be capable of delivering on a free and open access basis 33 essential climate variables and a number of indices and information for supporting services for 8 to 10 economic or societal sectors including tourism. Uh, the, the question really is how this can be uh, showcased at, uh, at COP22 in Marrakesh. But I don't know if either of you gentlemen have heard of, of the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Have you? Yeah, uh, I will answer here first, maybe, because it was directed to me. Um, no, I haven't. And um, on the other hand, there have been uncountable initiatives. Um, my stance on this is as follows. We need these initiatives. They are very important. However, we shouldn't forget that uh, even though we have lots of initiatives, we need to measure progress on these initiatives. That, that is what really matters. It's not the initiatives themselves. Um, then if we have something like 30 plus indicators, I think that to most lay people is already confusing. Uh, at least from the from my understanding of management management perspectives, so I would suggest that uh, most hotels will actually need help in uh, reducing emissions. And there's a lot of services. It could be this initiative. Uh, there's a lot of other initiatives. Uh, there's a lot of experts that can help um, a hotel to reduce uh, emissions at um, at no cost. Um, so I I definitely recommend and uh, applaud this initiative. 
Um, I, I really hope it's not just you know helping the usual greenwash. We, we do something. Um, we need, and uh, then I'm totally in, in favor of such initiatives. Thank you very much, Stefan. And uh, we're just running out of time rapidly here. I'll ask one more question to both you gentlemen. Uh, we started out by hearing some relatively good news on the policy environment, which obviously from the tourism sector standpoint has implications for whether you're dealing with a, a multi-country operation like a hotel, uh, a large chain hotel which has many establishments and large footprints across the globe, or if you're a small indigenous operator in a country, what are the opportunities coming out of the, of the Paris poli the strengthening policy agreement uh, not only from the Paris Climate Agreement, but also from the 2030 Agenda. What might be the opportunity for the small operators who, who operate only at the destination levels? Um, one, of the, one of the sort of important, um, well, as one of the things I mentioned earlier is, is getting in tourism further on, on, on the agenda as a sector, but one of the, the, the benefits to smaller um, uh, companies that operate within the tourism value chain is a number of things are going to happen within your country um, that you'll be able to benefit from. So your your grid will, will be able to, um, will be greened, if you will, um, in different ways and at different times. Um, transportation, there'll be new options from electrified, be it cars, uh, trains, other different types of initiatives. So there's a number of ways that tourism's carbon foot print will be reduced, um, your operations carbon footprint will be reduced, even if you do nothing. Um, that being said, you want to be a proponent of making some of those things happen at a local scale and, and being part, certainly within destinations where tourism is a major part of the local economy, um, tourism has to be at the discussion table and thus far it, it hasn't been to the extent that it needs to be because how the the changes happen with local transport is a, is a major implications for tourism satisfaction, visitor experience. And so if tourism is not there to, to have its voice um, made in terms of the carbon emission changes with the transport, those co-benefits aren't going to be there. So that's where I would encourage all the local um, companies um, to be part of that discussion, certainly at their community scale, um, but also lend their voice to the national discussions as well. Stefan, final words? I think Dan put it very eloquently, so I'll, um, I'll not add anything to that. Right, thank you very much. Well, we've run out of time, and uh, I hope that this has been a very uh, interesting and, and thought-provoking session and webinar for our participants. I'd first like to express on behalf of everyone here at UNEP, on, of the government of France as well as the government of the Kingdom of Morocco who uh, have sponsored this webinar as well as our two expert speakers, Dr. Daniel Scott, Professor in Climate Change at the University of Waterloo in Canada and Dr. Stefan Gosling, also Professor of, in Climate Research at the University of, of Linnaeus in Sweden. I'd like to thank you both for participating uh, and for um, uh, sharing your research and your knowledge and your wisdom with us here in tourism. We will be continuing uh, and, and we will of course publicize uh, all the information in the upcoming webinars. This is a recorded session and it will be emailed or made available to all of you who all of the participants that shared your email uh, address with us. Thank you very much to all and uh, I wish you a pleasant afternoon.